Do you have the stamina to talk about the Cuban Revolution for a second? 60th anniversary. Oh, let's do it. Well, hit me. So, um, I guess, yeah. I mean, no, I'll set it up a little bit more. I mean, I, I, well, first of all, I mean, are you, I feel like there's, there's three things that you need to hit. Right. And I'll just set, just for setting it up purpose, agree, disagree, reject, whatever. I feel like, okay, one is acknowledging that there are a lot of great accomplishments that are real, that are tangible, healthcare, education, but also the overthrowing of Batista, also the surviving for that amount of time, and also some of the international efforts, everything from, you know, like guerrilla efforts in the 60s and 70s, but also now more like, you know, doctors in Venezuela or Brazil, and now possibly in Mexico. Uh, then there's the um, U.S. piece of just like a, the sort of just abusive U.S. foreign policy, and in some ways the nature of the government's secondary. And then I think third, you know, is also being honest that, of course, there's been abuses in Cuba and, of course, there's been excesses. And, you know, furthermore, most people who are like, you know, Western, like, you know, Brooklynite socialists would totally not be used to or into some of the, like, restrictions they would experience if they lived in a Cuban context. And you should be honest about that. Anyway, I think those are like the three things to put on the table. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the bottom line is that Cuba has is a sign that even bad socialism can sometimes accomplish more than a functioning capitalist society can accomplish, right? So we live in a society today with millions of people who are uninsured, with uh, high rates of infant mortality and things like that for a developed country with in a city like new york thirty thousand plus um homeless people right a and in cuba you know there's an old cuban saying and it went something like um in the world i don't know what the exact amount like 190 million of people will um uh, children will sleep on the street tonight uh, none of them will be cuban and of course that wasn't completely true uh because i'm sure there were some cuban kids sleeping on the streets in miami but in you know in Cuba it was <laughs> right, probably true, right? Right, um, right, right? But at the same time, and uh, also you know I, I I've been to Cuba before. You know in the streets of Havana, it's incredibly uh, safe. There's no slums. There's none of the things that I'm used to seeing in let's say Kingston, Jamaica, or right. that I've seen. You know my family's Trinidad in so Port Port of Spain. Um, you know Trinidad and Trinidad, of course, is it's not a regular Caribbean island. It's kind of a petro state. You know, we have we have lot, we have a lot well, more yeah. money flowing in Trinidad yeah, than yeah. other Caribbean states, but so, still, but the very serious inequalities. And, and yeah. so, in other words, Cuba to me is a society that definitely has, if not classes in the ca the classic capitalist sense, it has castes, right? It does have layers. If you're a bureaucrat, your life outcome, if the bureaucrat's son or daughter is going to be a lot different than if you're you're born you know, poor in Havana. Right. But at the very least, it's a ruling bureaucracy that gets its legitimacy from giving people health care and from giving them education. Right. And that's very different than the way the legitimacy is derived from other uh, countries in the world. Right. Um, especially countries in the, the third world. And there's a lot of caveats you could apply. Like, for example, I think the bar embargo is kind of overstated as a reason for Cuban um, um, development lagging behind mm -hmm. in that up until the late 80s when Soviet subsidies for sugar started dwindling down, the weight of Soviet subsidies probably outweighed the impact of the embargo. That's an empirical question. No, you know, I, we can, I think we can dig that that's it. almost certainly the case, though, from my um, understanding. Although that being said, I guess the counter argument to that would be that's still subsidies being shipped in from like across the world versus a uh, actual economic encirclement from like a you know massive hegemon 90 miles away from where you are yeah and there was, was also also constantly trying to like assassinate yeah you. and then the 90s are proof there was legitimacy i mean yeah. there, there's no way a government like that could have stood up and exactly and if you think that a, a authoritarian government can just by strength of its military alone um stand up uh to popular pressure i mean one i think the irony is that this anti-communist anti-totalitarian argument actually does a disservice to the actual people suffering under dictatorships.
because people suffering under dictatorships can rise up and can make change. Definitely. Um, and and surely, you know, a country like East Germany was for a Eastern Bloc state, relatively prosperous, had had a very strong military, second in the Eastern Bloc to the Soviet Union. And it, you know, it collapsed overnight because when the popular legitimacy goes, the government goes. And in Cuba, the popular legitimacy never really um, went. Right. And I think as Americans, our primary goal should be to reject um, sanctions, reject the embargo, reject some of the propaganda against Cuba. But if down the road movements emerge fighting for uh, the free civil liberties that we enjoy in the U.S., right. um, then I think we have to also support those those movements because if we think it's okay for for you to start a you know a, a podcast and be on the radio without getting government approval, and for me to do the same with a magazine. Uh, obviously, we're, we're on the left, but we, we should think that a, a government shouldn't stand in the way of people doing the same thing in, in Cuba. But um, Right, and that's not what we're, yeah. obviously not what we're talking about when we talk about socialism. I think the only caveat to add to that is, and this is, you know, this is just the complexity and the reality. So as an example, like, we uncritically would support, like, liberation movements in Africa as an example that might get funding from, you know, China or the Soviet Union, which we would have plenty of criticisms of. So conversely, I could certainly support like, and, you know, movements against other authoritarian regimes that might also get some support mm -hmm. from the United States. Rojava is like sort of the prime example. Now, that being said, you know, teasing out what those movements in Cuba will look like that are like, organic versus, you know, just sort of like ongoing U.S. interference. That's going to be the trick. But I totally agree with you philosophically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be difficult. I think the bottom line is that Cuba, the Cuban moment has has gone. Um, there was a time up until the I mean, I think we look back now and we would say, what was the peak of state socialism? What was the peak of the left? And we might date it to the late 60s, early 70s. But it wasn't apparent at the time. At the time, it might have seemed like the mid to late 70s was the peak, maybe even 1979. So you had the, the victories on going in Angola. You have right. apartheid trying to uh, becoming shaky in South Africa. You have the sour, the, the coup in Afghanistan, the left wing coup in Afghanistan, which was called the Sour Revolution, which happened in April uh, 1978. You know, you have all this advance in the third world. You're about to have the um, revolution uh, or the coup, you know, left wing coup in, in Grenada. Right. Um, and, and it's not clear. And whether... Even Burkina Faso is not that far out. Yes, exactly. With Thomas Sankara. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so so I would say Cuba right now, though, is 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 isolated. It's in a different period. It's a different moment. It's trying to keep hold of what's good in its revolution. Right. But it's going down the Sino uh, Vietnamese model of having to bring in market development, having to bring in foreign investment in such a way that it's going to lose certain aspects of the Cuban system that is that is good. Um, so I, I think that in the end, if Cuba develops in such a way that there is increasing inequalities and gaps between rich and and the, the new kind of growing rich and people who are well connected in Cuba and people who are poor and suffering, you know, people who are, you know, I mean, there's there's prostitution in Cuba today. And that's often a source, for a lot of people for like hard currency for getting, right. you know, U.S. dollars and an economy that's split between a dollar. And also a major and a like yeah. so that was a source of legitimacy, too, in the beginning of the revolution. Like yeah. we got rid of that as like this prime site of like this, you know, of, of uh, exploitation of like the U.S. backed mafia state under Batista. But, right. But right. But I think we have right. the trust in the, the fact yeah. that when injustices grow, people will be able to resist it and will stand up uh, to it, you know, and uh, and reject the idea that, you know, um, there's a million Cubans out there just waiting for Americans to, right. to come in. Because I think that's one thing that the majority of Cubans can agree on, which is that they could, uh, you know, handle their own affairs without uh, Big Brother and in, um, in D.C. Uh, looking in. Perfect. Um, yeah. And did you and, have early affinities to the Cuban Revolution when you were like, I don't know, just getting politicized or when you were in high I, school, college? So I did sort of, but I had a, you know, because I got politicized pretty young. So that's like, you know, late 90s, like early aughts. I was. And this is maybe in a good way, but you know, th there's all these limits. But I was I was basically just sort of like Noam Chomskyized, mm. and so, 
one thing that he was pretty good about, I mean, he's obviously made his mistakes like everybody else, but he didn't, he didn't make like a place like Cuba, like a site of fantasy. So I think of anything I was maybe, and I, and I was fascinated obviously by the Cubans, but I think that I, I, you know, I read some about Castro and then very quickly it was sort of, yeah, I don't know. I think I was just too early on introduced to the problems. Mm. And I think that maybe my path was almost the opposite way of being like, okay, I'm glad that I wasn't idealistic about it. I'm glad that I didn't have like delusions of grandeur about Cuba. But actually, this is also like an incredibly, you know, important moment and in some ways a successful experiment. Mm -hmm. And even where it's been a failure, it was like a noble failure. But, you know, I also have, I have like attitude about that even in some ways for like, you know, some totally bougie reactionary things. Like I think you can make cases that totally separate from policy, JFK or Obama opened up important things culturally, mm -hmm. right? And so at certain points in my life, the way I'd look at politics, it would just purely be like, oh, well, JFK was a cold warrior who was fairly right wing on domestic policy and actually pretty poor on civil rights and backed McCarthy. And Obama was a bank bailout drone warrior, all of which is true. But I think like the fuller picture also is, well, there was actually some really culturally significant touchstones of both of these presidencies. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could say that with Obama. I think JFK just, you know, I don't know. You know, you don't think JFK opened up cultural space in the United States? No, especially. Yeah, I don't see no. it that way. Uh, I have to. Say, I'm I think, not sure. Obama, I could, I could give you. I, I think give you, I could give a lot of Obama, ground to Obama definitely. Now. Because, but mm -hmm. that's just because of, I mean, just purely on American white supremacy alone, first black president with a middle name Hussein is a, is a significant mm -hmm. thing. And also, I would say that some of the immigration elements. And he won too. Indiana. I think that's what he won. I mean, how the fuck did that happen? Because of his voice. Yeah. That's the great thing about Obama. He's the most Midwestern. I mean, that, that whole impression, that's why it's so funny. It's like, devil. <laughs> Sound, it sounds like he should be saying, like, you want some extra mayo with that? Yeah, because there's no <laughs> such thing as a Hawaii accent, right? Like, oh, I, I, well, I know, like, than, I think there's, like, yeah. actual, like, Wait, Hawaiian. Out of, out of the, yeah, out no, of the no, I know what you mean. Yeah. No, I don't think, I mean, the best I could think it would be, like, it would be some sort of, like, off-brand Cali accent, right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I never, I've never been there. I feel like that's one place I might skip between now and my death. Because it, it, it takes that's a, a really interesting place to want to skip. No, no, it just Doesn't takes a long to time to get there. If we lived yes. in California, then sure. But, you know, New York, it's like yeah. shit. <laughs> now, by the way, that was the most. I was just talking with, uh, by the way, everybody subscribe to Woke Bros, which we're going to have you on soon to talk uh, Nick's on. But Waz and I were talking about in the latest episode how Ebro Darden from Hot 97 just took over as head of, uh, I don't even remember. But uh, some, something, in, uh, I think... I forget what the fucking title is, but something at Apple Music, right? Like a, a big position on artist development at Apple Music, or curation at Apple Music. And uh, and we were just like, you know, Ebro is half black, half Jewish, which is like the ultimate media machine. And we were just, and I was thinking, with the way you did that with the Hawaii thing was one of the most Jewish things ever. It's first, it's a flight, <laughs> yeah. and it's so long, and then apparently it's so beautiful. But believe right, you're yeah. already so jet lagged, you could possibly enjoy. I'm it. a uh, short, neurotic <laughs> socialist from New York. You know, what can I say? <laughs> right. See, because we don't take races in a real thing, yeah. so we get that it's all scriptive identities. Right. Scriptive identities. You are fucking Jewish, yes. my friend. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely some <laughs> Jews running around like California that are like, dude, like, why is Boshkar so worried about the flight? <laughs> you just enjoyed that Michael Brooks show video, and you can get a lot more by subscribing to us here at the Michael Brooks show YouTube channel. It's literally right there.